Hello and welcome to episode 22 of Mad Knitting. My name is Susan, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm coming to you from Madison, Wisconsin, where I live and work. Um, I like to keep intros short and sweet, so I will put my social media handles on the screen and also in the description box below, and let's just get right to it. This is uh, my corner of the internet where I like to share about the my crafty life, the things I am making. That is almost exclusively knitting, it certainly is today, but I do occasionally foray into other fiber arts such as sewing and quilting, and I do sprinkle in some social and political commentary when it feels relevant to the project that I'm talking about. So I want to be upfront about that because I have a pretty strong position on a lot of different issues. and. Um, I just, I put that out there. So let's just dive right in. I'm going to start with finished objects. And the very first one I finished a little while ago and sent to the recipient. So I'm going to insert a video clip here so you can hear all about it. This is a special finished object segment that I am recording on Sunday, July 24, because um, I'm not ready for the full episode yet, but this is something that I knit on a whim and I need to send to the recipient right away. So I am recording a special segment to talk about it. So what uh, happened was my little brother had a birthday this week. His birthday was Friday, July 22nd. And one week ago today, I got the idea to make him a gnome for his birthday. Um, I had a hard time coming up with some, something to give him. This idea came to my head. And at the time I thought, oh sure, I can make one of these in two days. Now that didn't happen. So I just finished it on his birthday on Friday night. And um, I need to wrap it up and send it to him. So that is why I'm making this recording now. So first I will share the pattern. It is called Leave Gnome Stone Unturned by Sarah Shira of Imagine Landscapes. She is brilliant, brilliant gnome designer in particular. Um, she's made many gnome patterns. A lot of them are very popular. So I expect that uh, many of you may have seen some of these on Ravelry or on Instagram online. Um, she actually has a knit along going, the Year of Gnomes. So the idea with that is that you can join whenever you want, but she herself is making a gnome every month out of the 12 gnome patterns that she's released. Now thus far, I've made several, like dozens, from her original gnome pattern, which is called Never Not Gnoming. It's a very basic pattern. There are gnomes in, I think, three sizes. Um, the smallest is like an ornament you could hang from a Christmas tree or from anything you would hang ornaments from. And then there's a medium and a large size. The pattern, Leave Gnome Stone Unturned, I think was a mystery or sort of a subscription pattern from a year or two ago. And I just got it, <coughs> excuse me, when I decided to make it for my brother. So without further ado, here it is. So this has just so many fun details. There's a little pocket on the hat. I need to decide if I'm gonna put something in there. I, well, I definitely need to put something in there. I don't know what, maybe a coin, maybe a fun rock. I don't know. I mean, it's about the size, like this might hold a nickel. The body of the larger gnome has a ribbed pattern with some garter ridges for accents. The beard is knit from the top down in ribbing. And there's a bobble nose. And this is what really, this is what pulled me into the pattern was that the big gnome is wearing a backpack and the backpack is holding a little gnome. So the little gnome 
It's got a loop at the top. I don't know why it's got a loop at the top. I guess just because it's playful. There's no beard, but there is kind of a large nose. One of the details she includes is this braided edge around the bottom of the hat. That braided edge, by the way, <clears throat> is also around the top of the backpack. I think it's an Estonian braid. I know there are different kinds of braids. I think this is an Estonian one. It's very easy to do. It, your yarn gets a little twisted when you do it, so that's the only annoying part. Um, there's eye cord for the backpack straps. The backpack itself is actually stitched onto the gnome right under the edge of the hat. So the gnome, the little gnome comes out of the backpack, but the backpack is attached to the big gnome. Anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed making this. It's so fun. It's fun to make. I mean, there's little fiddly bits, but it, the whole thing is so charming that I didn't even mind the fiddly bits. Um, the one regret I have is that I didn't use more weighted stuffing in the big gnome. So she explains to you like exactly when to stuff it, you know, how, how firmly you should pack the stuffing, when you should start adding weighted stuffing. Um, and I should have added more weighting stuffing to this because if you just set it on a surface, like it's, it's balancing okay on my hand, but if you put it on something flat like a table with the little gnome in the backpack, it tends to tip back. So I wish there was more weight. I'm not taking it apart and redoing it. But if I had put more weight in the big gnome, then I don't think I would have that balance problem. So anyway, um, just for funsies, I entered this into the Year of Gnomes make along. I don't even know if they have prizes. It's just a thread on Ravelry in the Imagine Landscapes group. Um, there's a hashtag for Instagram also. Um, and I also entered it into the Yarniacs podcast, their Colors of Fall knit along, which I have explained in previous episodes, but essentially they take the color palettes released by Pantone for Fashion Week for both New York and London for fall, winter 2022, and also spring, summer, because of course in the Southern Hemisphere, they'll be entering spring and summer um, come September. And it just so happens that two of the colors I used are in the London Fall palette. So this yellow gold color, I think is pretty close to the spicy mustard that's in the London palette. And the brown I used, you can see there's some tonal, a little bit of variegation because it's tonal, but I think the brown from the hat on the big gnome and the body on the little gnome, I think that's pretty close to chicory coffee. So I went ahead and entered it there. Um, of course, for the colors of fall knit along, one of the requirements is that you take a styled photo. So you've, you have to start and finish the project within a certain span of time. So between June, the June solstice and the September equinox, and then you have to style it either with the outfit you would wear or if it's not a piece of clothing, like this is obviously not a piece of clothing, um, just style it somehow. So I will put a picture here, but what I did was I got a really big gnome that I made several years ago <clears throat> with that original Never Not Gnoming pattern. And I stuck it in a backpack that I was wearing and I had my daughter take a picture of me holding the gnome, wearing a gnome in a backpack with a gnome in the backpack I was wearing. That was just fun to do. Last thing before I go, I just want to show you the yarn I used. This is all leftover sock yarn. Labels are long, long gone. Most of this I've had for quite a long time, but I remember most of what it is. So the, <coughs> excuse me, the brown I used is the main color for the hat. I am pretty sure, this is all I have left of it. I am pretty sure this is Knit Picks sock yarn. 
Now they call it Stroll. At the time I bought this, I don't remember if it was called Stroll or if it was whatever they used to call their sock yarn, and I'm blanking now on what that was. Um, but this is a brown color. It might have been called Kindling. I'm not 100% sure. But I do remember that I bought it to make socks for my brother for his birthday. I don't even know if he still has them. Um, but it's kind of cool that I made him socks out of this yarn and then later used it for the gnome. For the second color for this red, I wish I knew what this was. I have quite a lot left. I do not remember where I bought it. I do not remember who the dyer is or the company. The label is gone. I know that I really, really like it. These are just the shades of red that I like. Um, it's mostly red kind of going from a deep cherry red to a lighter strawberry red and there's a little bit of a um, few streaks of like lavender and some gold going through, but it's gorgeous. Um, I don't remember, I think I made socks out of it, but I don't have those socks. So either they wore out or I gave them away. I just, I don't remember at all, unfortunately. But this is the second color I used. The third color, this gold, I've had for ages and ages. I'm pretty sure that I bought this when my kids were really little because I remember that we went through a phase when my son was a toddler. He is now 16 and at a driving lesson. Um, I remember that he was really into the color gold. Maybe it was early elementary school. Anyway, I've had this at least 10 years, if not longer. And I bought this at some yarn festival or something. I think maybe the brand was the March Hare. I have no idea if they're still around. But anyway, it's it's a tonal bunch of gold. And I actually have another uh, little ball of this in my leftover bin. But this, I thought this went really nicely with the, these are kind of fall colors, don't you think? With the brown and the red. And what I use for the beard, usually I try to find an undyed or cream colored yarn. This is what I used. It actually picks up some of the other colors pretty well. It's very pale, so I thought it worked really nicely for the beard and noses and the, the ends of the arms. This is from Knit Circus. I don't remember the color, but I think I picked it up on their sale shelf. It's just their sock yarn. Um, and it was, it was either like an experiment or a one of a kind or a misty. I just, I don't remember but I know I knit socks out of this. I still wear them. Um, and it's mostly creamy and it's got a few very pale pastel sort of Easter egg colors, which aren't my usual jam, but as I've said before, pretty much anything I will put on my feet. But it worked really nicely with these other colors to make the gnomes. And gnomes, these little gnomes take so little yarn, I have a lot left. I kind of wish I could just use it up and be done with it. The brown is what I have the least of, but the rest of these, like this is, this is a significant amount left. Anyway, so that is my special finished object segment. And now we'll get back to the rest of the episode. So that project was a whole lot of fun to make and I have found that when I get started making gnomes, um, I kind of want to make more of them and want to make more little things. So I did end up purchasing just the other day uh, the mystery knit along for the gnome that Sarah Shearer has designed for this fall. Um, I'm not really a fan generally of signing up for subscriptions or, and I've never done a mystery pattern. Um, sometimes designers aren't always reliable about getting things out and I like to know what I'm getting into, but um, the ones from Imagine Landscapes have all been totally fun and um, I kind of think it's hard to go wrong with a gnome as opposed to like a sweater or shawl or something where you never know if you're gonna like the finished object. So 
stay tuned for that. Hopefully I will actually make it and it won't be just a pattern that sits on my shelf. Um, next finished object is what I'm wearing. I've talked about this before in the last couple of episodes, but um, I finished, finished, finished it. I got that last bit of edging done around the neck and hid the ends, and now I can wear it. So I'm gonna stand up so you can see it better. This is the Heart of Glass. It is by Mary Annarella. I am standing on my tiptoes trying to show the bottom because that's the interesting part. She's known as Lyrical Knits. And I'm very happy with how this turned out. It's just a fantastic pattern. So I've talked a bit about the construction in previous episodes and I don't wanna repeat myself too much here. I've also talked about the yarn in previous episodes, but um, just to recap briefly, the sweater is knit from the top down. You cast on for one shoulder and do some short rows and things and get to the other shoulder and then you have to do the front and it's the same thing, only with a lower neckline. And then you're going back and forth on the front and on the back and then you join under the arms and go in the round until you get to the lace part at the bottom. So by far the most complicated part is the top for the shoulder and neck shaping. One of the really nice things about the pattern is that um, in addition to having things worded very clearly and explained very clearly, at least from my, from my experience, she also adds photos of the top of the sweater at different stages. So in case all the words don't completely make sense, you can at least see what it's supposed to look like as you go. I did have some gauge issues with this. I had to go all the way down to a size two needle for the top part where I was going back and forth. And when I joined under the arms, I learned the hard way that a size two in the round where I was only knitting and not purling made the gauge just a whole lot tighter. So I had to rip back and keep going with a size three. And I am very happy with how it turned out. Um, I admit I didn't check the gauge very carefully once I had gotten down to needles that small, but it fits, so as far as I'm concerned, it works. Um, I did bring, I have one skein of this yarn left, so I can actually show it to you. It's Hemp for Knitting, All Hemp 6. I believe it is still available out there someplace. Um, the color num here is just a number, but this is like a really deep teal. I like it a lot. Um, no, it's all hemp three. Uh, fingering weight, so it's very lightweight. Um, and since I have a whole skein left, if I wanted, I suppose I could pick up stitches and do like a cap sleeve, but I don't think I will. I really like it how it is. It's very, um, it's very cool, like very comfortable and cool to wear. And it was not as uncomfortable to knit as I expected. Hemp is a plant fiber and has no stretch or elasticity. I, it behaves, I expect, a lot like linen. I don't, I think maybe I knit a linen washcloth like a long time ago, but aside from that, I don't really have experience knitting with linen. And I thought it would be hard on my hands, but it really wasn't. Um, so it could have been partly the needle choice. I was using metal needles, so they were slippery. Um, so the stitches were sliding very easily, but in any case, um, I'm very happy with how this turned out. So that's my sweater. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I am sounding a whole lot better than in my last couple of episodes and probably better than the, the gnome finished object insert. Cause that was from almost two weeks ago. Um, Thankfully, I think all that COVID is out of my system, finally. So, <clears throat> my next finished object is nothing to write home about, but I might as well show you <laughs> since it's another thing that's done. This is a hat that I started. I haven't even blocked it, but I'm gonna consider it done because I'm ready for it to be, you know, out of my life. <laughs> But this is a hat 
that I just, I dug through my leftover bin to find some yarn to use up. Um, I have a tub that's maybe this big, I'm not sure how many quarts it is, and it's getting, it's where I put partial skeins when I'm done with something, and it was getting fuller and fuller. So when I was headed off to a performance or something to watch, I pulled out some leftover DK weight yarn <clears throat> in this pale pinkish, bluish pink color, and some mohair silk that happened to be a perfect match. And I just cast on 100 stitches and went with that. Now, if you look carefully at the top, you can see that I actually ran out of the DK yarn in the pink and had to finish off. I found like a cream color just to do at the very top. I'm not in love with this hat. Um, I did this four point decrease, as you can see, and it didn't, it doesn't lie very well. Um, also, I made the hat just a little bit short. Um, I won't try it on for you because my hair is that well. Actually, I could. Why not? I'll try it on. But it's, it's warm and fuzzy. And it like, I know it looks like it fits because it does come over my ears, but I've got a little bit of my earlobe showing. And in Wisconsin, it gets really cold. So I need a hat that will actually come all the way down and cover my ears maybe and then some. So this doesn't quite fit the bill. I think it would be okay for a child um, as long as a child could tolerate the mohair, which I don't find itchy, but you never know. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of stick it in my pile of things to give away and see see if there's an appropriate time to, to donate it or give it to somebody. Now, when I was digging in that leftover bin for something else, which you'll hear about in my works in progress segment, um, I found another whole skein of that mohair silk. I didn't realize I had another whole skein of it. So I have to tell you that when I talked about that hat in the previous episode, I misspoke. I said that it was from Elan.com. Maybe that's where I bought it. I don't know, it was so long ago, but I found this other whole skein and um, part of the label. The theme of this episode might be Susan doesn't keep her labels. <laughs> so I have, it looks like it must have ripped off. So this is what I have. It says something about Annie Blatt, fine kid. Okay. So far, so good. Okay, it does not want to focus. There we go. Um, the fiber content is missing. It's made in France, but it also says this is the weird part. It says orange. And this label was pretty firmly in the skein, so I think it goes with the skein. I don't know how this got labeled orange. Maybe it was the wrong label. Um, anyway. If anybody out there has been knitting for a long time and is familiar with this yarn and knows more about it, please let me know. Um, I like it, it's nice and soft, and now I have a whole bunch more. I don't even know how much is in here other than it's 50 grams, so I will have to find some other way to use it, but that's the story of that hat. I actually have two more finished objects to show you, and I'm gonna put my hair back up because it's very warm today. Oh no, I shouldn't, because one of them's a hat. Um, all right, so the first one is the Livy Shawl. I had started this in my last episode and now it is finished. So this is a pattern by Tammy Gore. I think she also has the business name Narrow Path Designs. And I have to say that the reason I had my eye on this pattern, which I have for a long time, is because Knit Circus, which if you've been watching, you know they're a favorite company of mine. They are a local dyer here in Madison. They used to have a brick and mortar shop that recently closed so they could expand their wholesaling. So you can easily get their yarn online or if you're local to here, several shops now carry it. But they had a sample knit in completely different yarn than this, but it was just so attractive that I kept, you know, it was just in the back of my mind as a really good option for a two color shawl. 
So that's what I ended up doing with this. This is Knit Circus yarn. It is the base Opulence and which is a uh, merino cashmere nylon blend in a fingering weight. So for the first color, I used a gradient called My Funny Valentine. And if you look at one end to the other, the color change is very gradual, but you can see that there is clearly a difference from one end to the other. And this lighter color that I use is called Plenty of Fish, and I believe that is a discontinued color. But I really liked the way they look together. This is the, it's an ever so pale, like, blue with a hint of sort of a sea green blue color. Unfortunately, when I blocked it, the darkest, the most saturated end kind of bled all over everything. So. If I had plans to give this away, I don't think I can now because it's pretty blotchy. Um, and that's a bummer. That is a risk, by the way, with red, any yarn dyed with red is in the base. So if you have red or an intense pink or a purple, um, I suppose, or a dark orange, it is not too unusual for that to bleed. It's just harder for the dye to stay fast to the yarn. So, you know, if I'd really anticipated that, I could have washed the yarn ahead of time, but I didn't. I took my chances and I ended up with a little bit of a splotchy shawl. But, except for that, I am really very happy with it. So, I'm trying to, this is awkward, but I'm trying to like, Hold it so you can see the whole thing. It's a really easy, intuitive pattern. You start at this end and there are increases and decreases to make this deep V and it's symmetrical up to a point around here. And then <clears throat> you change the pattern of increases and decreases so that it is asymmetrical and you end up with this point which I think is really cool. I think one of the things, the other things that really attracted me to this pattern was that there's almost no lace in it. I love the look of lace. I'm not always very patient with knitting lace. Um, even the bottom of this, even the bottom of the heart of glass, you know, there's just this few inches at the bottom. And um, as much as I love how it looks, I didn't really love knitting it. Um, knitting it in hemp was kind of an added not fun thing, but I don't know. I just, I love textures with cables and other stitch patterns and things, but yarn overs and ugh, just not my favorite. Um, so there are a few sections where you do some really, really simple eyelets, as you can see. And you can probably tell that in this section, I didn't quite center them properly, but you know, otherwise it's just garter stitch with increases and decreases which is just my kind of thing. Plus the shape is very scarf-like. You know, it's kind of long and skinny. So I can wear it like a scarf. I can, I am not like a stylish person, but I find shawls like this pretty easy to wear. I could actually, you know, double fold it and pull the ends through the, through the loop if I really wanted to show it off and be fancy, I could drape it across my shoulders like this. So I like it. And I guess I will be the one wearing it, which is fine by me because I also love the yarn and how it feels. Now, the shawl didn't quite take all of the yarn in the skeins and I was really in the mood to use it up. Um, I guess I've been kind of on this train of using up leftovers or finding partial skeins and using it up so that they don't just build up in my stash, which is already rather enormous. So, um, it so happened that around the time I finished that shawl, Gudrun Johnston, who is the Shetland trader, who's been 
she is actually from Shetland, the islands, you know, in the very northern part of Scotland and has been well known for a long time for her beautiful, beautiful Shetland color work designs. Um, a while ago, she released a hat called the Busta Beanie. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, she ran a sale on all of her Shetland Trader patterns. It was a very generous sale. It was like 40% off. And I've had my eye on that hat pattern for quite a long time because I just thought it was so cool. So I went ahead and purchased it and I knit the Busta Beanie. I knit the hat out of the rest of that yarn. And you can see, and so this one didn't get as splotchy, which is why I think that the, the dye was bleeding out of the most saturated end. Um, Cause this just didn't, I didn't have that problem. Um, so I knit my way almost to the very end of that gradient pink yarn. And this is like, this is like not my favorite pink y'all. It's like bubble gum, straight up Barbie pink, but it still looks so cool. So what attracted me to this pattern was just this really interesting, I'm afraid if I move, it'll go out of focus, was this really interesting color work pattern where you've got waves. I mean, it almost looks like frequency waves or something. And in her pattern, she has two contrast colors, not one. So when the curve is going one way, you're using one contrast color. And when it's going the other way, you use the other contrast color. But I just wanted to use up the gradient and see how it played out. So, you know, if I wanted, I could wear the Livy shawl and I could wear the Busta Beanie together and I could be very coordinated and chromatic with all the pink <laughs> going from one shade of pink to another to the top of my head. It's a little bit loose. I think my row gauge is probably different than hers, but because it's color work, you get through a certain, you have to do a certain number of repeats before you follow the chart for the decreases. So, you know, I could have tried to work something out differently, but I didn't, but I like it. Um, I'm gonna go back on something I've said in previous episodes where I've talked about how I don't like using superwash yarn for color work. That is still true. Um, the opulence is mostly superwash merino and you know, like any superwash yarn, it doesn't, it doesn't, even though it's a little bit fuzzy, um, this particular base they use uh, is very, there's a little bit of a halo almost on it. You know, it's not ropey like some other superwash fingering weight yarns. Um, but even so, when I was working the color work, it didn't want to like stick to itself, which is kind of what you want when you're working stranded color work like this. Like if I had used Jamison and Smith, which is what the pattern calls for, then I think I would have gotten that more of that blending. Um, that said, I'm happy with this because it's cool. It's cool looking. And I was able to use up the rest of that yarn. So, um, so that is the Busta Beanie. That is all my finished objects. That is quite a few. Um, but you know, I knit all the time, so it really shouldn't be all that surprising. Okay. Um, when it comes to works in progress, I don't have all that many to share because I did kind of get on this finishing spree. Um, so I think I will start with, I will start with the Buffalo Rose Tea, even though once again, I don't have much to say about it. In fact, I was planning on skipping this for today, but I finally last night picked it up and started knitting on the sleeve again. So just for posterity's sake, I will tell you about it. This is the Buffalo Rose Tea. It is by Carol Chan of Casey Knitting Co. I love the color work pattern on the main body. That is what attracted me to this design and why I bought it. Even though it was sort of a pain to do, 
it looks really cool. And I think when it's blocked, it will look even better. Um, I won't enumerate yet again all the problems I had with the top of the sweater, but there was a lot of rejiggering of uh, a little bit of rejiggering for the sleeve stitch count so that it wasn't so they weren't too full. And I had to do a lot of reworking of the neck. So when I get it all done and to my liking, I will talk more about that in a, maybe the next episode, whichever, whenever I get it done and talk about it. Um, but what I did last night was pick it up and start doing, start working on the sleeves again, because I am finally on the right track for the sleeve. So it's just a matter of decreasing down to the circumference I like, getting them long enough, doing the cuff, and then finishing the other sleeve before I revisit this neckline. And I think in my last, uh, the last time I talked about this, I forgot to say what yarn this is. Um, the gauge I'm getting is five stitches to the inch. So I am using Cascade 220 for this main blue, um, just a plain navy color. For the lighter color, this is Barocco Lanus in the color Fog, which is left over from a sweater I made for my daughter at the end of last year. And this red is Northampton Valley Yarns. Um, it might be the color Garnet, but it's like a really pretty, sort of like a deep, rich red. Um, that is the Roses. So that is the sweater. I think I've been somewhat unmotivated to work on it just because it's summer and it's pretty warm. It's been really muggy lately and, you know, I certainly won't feel like wearing this for a little while and even just having it on my lap to knit has been kind of uncomfortable. So smaller, lighter things are really, really where it's at. My last work in progress is another plain thing kind of buried in this basket. So I gotta dig it out. Oh no, here it is on the floor. Okay. So once again, going with the theme of me digging through leftovers, finding yarn without labels. Um, and while I'm at it, going down memory lane, because when you find leftover yarn from a project from like more than 10 years ago, you start thinking about, at least I start thinking about where I was in my life at that point. So I'll tell you about this yarn first and then I'll tell you what I'm making. This I, the label is long gone. Don't expect to see labels from me on any kind of consistent basis. This is yarn. Pretty sure this is Mountain Colors. An all wool, something twist. They might've called it River Twist. So you can see that it's like dyed in the wool and it's like the plies are different colors. So it's not exactly a slow changing gradient, but there's some variegation in here. I really love this yarn. It feels so nice and the color is really interesting. I bought it, I remember buying it and making a pair of mittens for my daughter when she was really little, like maybe three or four years old. Um, those mitt I have no idea where those mittens are now. I don't know if they wore out or if I actually gave them away to another child when she grew out of them. But the point is that out of a hundred gram skein of wool yarn, knitting a pair of toddler size mittens hardly took any of it. So when I was digging through my leftovers, looking for something to cast on really quick, uh, cause of the thing I was doing. I found this and figured there would be plenty for a hat. So I'm doing um, another version of the one by one ribbed hat that I've, you know, I did a couple of them in Iceland out of leftover sock yarn. Um, this version is size seven needles. I cast on hundred stitches and I am knitting one by one rib for a long way. So there will be enough of a cuff to turn up and when it's a couple inches longer than this, I'll decrease for the crown. And I think I'll come up with a better decrease system than that pink hat I showed earlier, um, just cause I don't really like how that came out. But I'll figure that out when I get there. So um, 
this is the kind of project I like to have going when I am out somewhere, you know, it's either something like this or a sock. So if I am at a concert performance or if I'm sitting through a meeting in person somewhere, and in this case, here's where the personal and political collide, okay? So in this case, a friend of mine invited me to a fundraising event. It was on a Sunday, maybe two weeks ago, called Share the Table. And it was with Francesca Hong, who is, she's not my representative because I don't live in her district, but she is the representative for seat 76 in the state assembly. And she's also a chef and owns a restaurant in downtown Madison. So she was doing this share the table event because she's running again, of course, with Mandela Barnes, who is our Lieutenant Governor, also candidate for Senate, really hoping he beats Ron Johnson this fall. He's running against Ron Johnson. Um, and Mandela Barnes is, oh, I forget how old he is. He's young though. He's like in his mid thirties. He's a black man. He's from Milwaukee. He really um, has the kind of lived experience that we really need to see representing our state in the Senate, in the US Senate. So the way this event worked was we show up at this establishment that's kind of a restaurant and also purveyor of local foods. They cooked a meal in front of the crowd, answered questions, um, talked about various issues. Um, the focus of this event was um, in fact, the fundraiser was for an organization that supports reproductive rights and abortion access. So they were, that was what they were talking about a lot. Um, but the whole time, at least until our food was served, the whole time I was knitting this hat. And I think at that event, I got maybe this much done because, you know, it's worth weight and there was quite a lot of talking and question answering and stuff before the food came out. But now whenever I pick it up, I think about, you know, I think about the fact that I went to that, to that event, to that fundraiser um, with a couple of politicians who I really admire. I think they, they are really authentic and um, really care about why they are running for office and the people they represent. And I think that's important. Um, during that, Francesca said something that just really stuck with me. Um, she was talking about how when Roe v. Wade was overturned, you know, just at the end of June, that all of a sudden there were these people who were uh, feeling activated and galvanized because this was something happening that affects them or could have affected them um, or potentially could affect their children, you know people that didn't necessarily consider themselves to be political. Um, she pointed out, by the way, she's Korean American. So she pointed out that if you're a person who says, oh, I'm not political, you know, I stay away from politics, that is coming from a particular point of privilege because it means that you live in, in a body that is not politicized, right? So for example, I am a white woman I am middle class. I'm the kind of person who, if I chose, I could say, oh, I'm not political because a lot of the things that happen in our political system don't necessarily affect me as deeply and directly as they do people who are marginalized because of race or ethnicity or income or any number of things. But then she said, this is the statement that really stuck with me, she said, the thing about politics is you might say you don't do politics, but eventually politics will come back around and do you. And of course that got a big round of applause from the crowd because it was so true, but it was just a really important statement I thought. And I think that the overturning of Roe v. Wade is just a one big example of how people who do not wish to be involved or interested in politics will be affected by it because it's going to affect their healthcare. Um, or the health care of somebody they know and love. So I think about all that when I'm working on this hat, when I'm making this hat. Um, one last thought I would like to leave you with 
because I don't have reading content or sewing content and but there is there was another thing that had me thinking um, a few weeks ago when Europe was in the grip of this horrible heat wave um, I was listening to a podcast it's a daily news podcast from slate called what next and it's one of my favorite news podcasts they, they take one topic every day and dig pretty deep into it so this particular day they were talking about that heat wave why europe is um affected differently by heat waves in the united states it had to do with you know lack of air conditioning and some other things um but in the middle of it, there was this little nugget where the reporter who was in Europe was talking about the information that the French government was sending out. So they were disseminating these announcements and other information about like tips for staying cool, signs of heat stroke, just a lot of sort of general public health and public safety information, you know, where to find cooling centers in your area if you don't have air conditioning, etc. But in that information, they also included because it's France, of course, they included a recipe for a delicious watermelon salad um, because that is a good thing to eat when it's hot outside. And with that recipe came the reminder, don't forget to enjoy the pleasures of life or something to that effect. And I just thought, what a good reminder and something that I really needed to hear that day because I was listening to this early in the morning and I was thinking about the climate crisis and I was thinking about, you know, all these other things that that literally keep me up at night sometimes and make me worry about the future and just, you know, things I can't do about right this second, but still have me, you know, concerned. And that reminder, keep enjoying the pleasures of life. I mean, that's why we're here, right? We should enjoy, like, let's find ways to enjoy the things that we like simple things like if you have a watermelon and you like watermelon enjoy that watermelon if you have lovely wool to knit with enjoy that um enjoy the good food you have to eat i hope you have good food to eat uh enjoy a tall glass of ice water if that's what you really enjoy and that's what you have so I will leave it at that, but I just thought that was a really important thing to remember and a good message and just the kind of thing we need to hear. And I thought it was really kind of amazing that that was a message coming from the government because you don't, you know, we don't always hear things like this. We hear a lot of practical things or policy things, but not necessarily those human things that are so important. So. My final note as I sign off, enjoy the pleasures in your life and I will see you next time.